Welcome to Pirate Living Podcast. We're your hosts, Karan and Kristen. On this podcast, we are highlighting ordinary people living extraordinary lives. These are pirates who take small, bold actions daily to create social change. Pirate life is all about rebelling and breaking the rules for good. Creating lasting social change starts by first breaking our inner rules. After all, the hardest rules to break are your own. The pirates we highlight have dedicated themselves to creating good trouble. Today, we are chatting with William Burnett. William is a veteran who has thrown himself into a number of different worlds and is driven by a desire to help others. He has used psychology and breathwork to help himself overcome his ailments and is now using those tools he learned to support high-performing humans to overcome their blocks through breathwork and other practices. And William, we are thrilled to be chatting with you today. Thank you so much for having me and I'm excited to be here with you both. (laughs) Thanks for being here. So you are currently living the life of a land pirate over in Australia. You've been traveling around, about to come stateside. And um, will you leave us the tale of what started you on your very own pirate journey? I would love to. Land pirate. I I like Mm -hmm. that better. (laughs) (laughs) It's better than gray nomad. I am getting grays. Um, (laughs) My my journey started, um, I imagine my journey started right back when I joined the military. I joined the military from a very, very young age, uh, 16 and nine months, actually. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I grew up in an organization uh, that is uh, wildly discouraging of authenticity and solo driven missions. And so I spent over a decade in there to which uh, my own psychology and my physiology was conditioned to the vigors and the stories that were attached to uh, military life, if you will. Uh, When I left the military, I struggled immensely, physically, emotionally, uh, financially, I struggled. I'd, I'd been part of a system that was very secure. I relied on that heavily of that security of being able to go to a place of work and be paid every, um, every two weeks, no matter what. And then this idea of you cannot be fired, you cannot be asked to leave. Um, And so there's a lot of security with that. And, and with that, you start to teach your psychology and your physiology that this is our life and, and everything else uh, seems to coexist outside of that. Um, When I left and I was struggling, um, I would, I would assert that nine to nine to 12 months, uh, there was a period where I I would imagine was rock bottom. And and for me, um, I'd gone from being this exciting, extroverted, social, um, very competitive athletic type person to somebody who was waking up and, and, and really hating life. Um, from all accounts, my life looked amazing. I, I was married to, uh, beautiful woman who I'd met on deployment. She is from uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, So she'd moved to Australia. I have four or three beautiful kids at this stage. Um, Yet I was, I was really struggling. And uh, there are a lot of stories that played out um, prior to me even diving into my, into my childhood or anything like that. There are a lot of stories in my, my late teens to early adulthood, um, that I was running off, that the system was running off. Um, I did the rounds. I got a job at F45, horrible job. That taught me a lot of things. Um, so my background is strength and conditioning and human performance uh, in the military. That was a job I did in the military. Um, and so when I left, I relied on going to do something like that. Um, after F45, I went back to coaching CrossFit again. And then after that, I'd had enough and I started my own uh, business. This was exactly where the pirate life started for me. The business I started um, was a gym, a holistic gym where I taught um, primitive movement. So I was helping people uh, break through, excuse me, limiting um, biomechanics or, or movement patterns from old injuries by rolling around on the ground like a baby or moving around on the ground like a lizard. Um, As well as that, I was applying simple but very effective breathwork techniques to get people into non-ordinary states so that they could have these breakthrough moments sitting on the gym floor with some incense burning in the background. 
um, it was a very unorthodox way to, to teach people how to move. Um, but I, it felt very aligned to me and it felt um, very uh, necessary at the time. Uh, I had a small, small detail of, of clients that would come through daily. Uh, and then from there, I had a horrible uh, breakup with my business partner, who was a longtime friend, um, to which I learned some more lessons. And from there, I started to uncover uh all the things that I was compartmentalizing, I was actually, most of my coaching was a projection because I was projecting all of these things of myself onto my clients. Yes, they happen to be accurate and yes, they happen to help my clients, but I was still projecting. Uh, and so uh, I took the bull by the horns, threw myself into study uh, around um, some spiritual practices, plant medicines, breath work, uh, and then also uh, meditation and within 12 months, I noticed a severe increase of mobility in my body. I noticed that my moods were less rigid and, and less like body. I, I noticed that um, something as simple as my hair and my skin health, like, you know, you know, when you look in the mirror some days and you can just tell, you can tell your body, where your body's at by what your skin's trying to tell you. Right. Um, and so I was noticing that and, and, I drew it down to my morning practice, my daily check-ins, um, my weekly routines of going through these spiritual practices. Uh, and from there, I threw myself deeper and deeper and deeper. I threw more money at it so I could study with the, the best of the best. I applied myself academically. I applied myself physically. Um, and without diving into the long story of my, me leaving uh, the military, I had a long list of physical ailments uh, to which don't exist anymore today as I sit here in front of you. And I credit it to everything that I've put my, uh, my heart and soul into in the last six years. What about the more um, like mental or spiritual ailments from when you left the military? Yeah, what were they? Oh yeah. And how have you, like, how has this work helped, helped with those as well? And those stories. Good question. Um, so as I mentioned, there, there were a lot of stories. There was a lot of conditioned um, belief systems. There was a lot of ideas about the world that I had um, essentially been exposed to, but ne never really given myself autonomy to lean into that. Like as an 18 year old kid, and there's an organization telling you that war is good and, and you know, it's, it's doing the best for our country. You're protecting your country. That is a true statement for the individual, not for the organization. And so I had stories like that playing out. So when I, when I left, um, I suffered from, you know, PTSD, I suffered from depression and I suffered in the sense that um, my identity had shifted not necessarily the PTSD, but definitely the depression. My identity identity had shifted, uh, and there was no one there to tell me or to help me or to provide me the education. What you're going through is an actual thing. You're not simply leaving the military and becoming a civilian. There is a huge transformation in that that gap right there. Um, and so, a lot of the the story work that I did um, was less. Um, strategic as in lifted would provide where we get the opportunity to break down stories and, and bring through them and and go through different types of language it was more like getting real with myself putting myself in a non-ordinary state so that my ego was no longer louder than my actual conscious mind mm -hmm. and and i'd be having these conversations like shut up will just can i swear, can mm -hmm. I swear? it's pirate <laughs> pirate podcast <laughs> <laughs> shut up we'll just fucking do it just fucking do it because it's good for you you know and i would have these conversations and this was how i would break down stories and i'd put myself in extraordinary situations like i'd um you know get really uncomfortable with doing something that felt really uncomfortable but seeing the outcome of putting a smile on my wife's face and it might have been something as simple as not doing something for me and doing something for her but having that conversation prior and i'd get into these non-ordinary states through breath work and simply let go and surrender with the idea that I could potentially die or not. The real truth is, yeah, I did die. I, there, there were parts of me that would continue to die. And there are parts of me that I allow still to die to this day because 
it's necessary for me to progress uh, as a human and as a leader and as a professional, it's necessary for me to let go of those parts. I don't forget about them. You never forget about those things, mm-hmm. nor should you. They make you who you are, but you can let go of the hold that you have on them, this, this psychological hold that just stresses us the hell out. Yeah, I imagine, you know, you had to let go of the role that you were playing in order to kind of discover your, your true identity. You had to let go of the role of the soldier to figure out who William actually is inside, rather than the role that you were supposed to be playing for the last 10 years. Would that, would that be accurate? Very accurate. Yeah. yeah. And look, like what? I'm one of four children. I come from a very alpha dominant environment. Well, it's not alpha, but you know, from the outside looking, you would perceive it to be an alpha dominant environment. Um, And so there was like primitive behaviors that I believed I met as a soldier or as a provider or as a man, or, you know, these stories that I honestly believed because of the way I was influenced or signaled by my father's behavior or the way that my father showed up and the way that my grandfather showed up. And it wasn't necessarily spoken word, son, you need to be this person. It was more the epigenetics of it. It was the way that their physiology signaled mine and how I believed that I needed to continue. Mm-hmm. You know, I was the, um, at the time when I joined the military, I was fourth generation to join the military and, and serve my country. Um, and also part of a, a long, long list on William Burnett, the seventh, you know, firstborn. And so there are a lot of levels to it. And, mm-hmm. and so when I shifted from this identity to me, the honest, real me, the, the, the boy, the boy, I was what, 20, 27, I was when I discharged the boy who wanted to simply sit there and cry and cry and cry because I was no longer this person. Like that was, that was this shift. And, mm-hmm. and there wasn't, there was, there wasn't, there was my wife there. There was my wife there, which to this day, I look back, I'm like, Whoa, I, I don't want to know what would have happened if she wasn't there mm-hmm. um, to create a space for me to lean into and cry or mm-hmm. create a space for me to see um, through a different lens or remind me of who I was, you know? And so, and, Look, my children do that as well every single day. But as an adult and you receive words of affirmation or you receive the energy and love of somebody else, uh, it's a big deal. It's mm-hmm. a big deal. There's so much there too with the generational, which you said in your, like you're the seventh and um, fourth line military that when you made that choice for you, you chose to end that, those generational stories that were holding on to you as well. So in that you get to pass that on to your kids too so they can choose am I gonna continue like do I want to feel like going into the military or don't I but it's going to be more of a choice and less of a story playing out so that's that's cool too yeah and um you know I have two children to a, a previous marriage and I have two children now to my my wife and um the the two elders uh we uh we 50 50 custody which which is amazing um and their mother is and was in the military as well as well as her partner as well and so they're surrounded in this environment and with my kids um my youngest two and those two i make it my utmost priority to remind them that they are their own unique self and they need to explore that to the fullest capability i want to encourage them in their authenticity create an opportunity that for them to realize they have the license they have the autonomy to make this thing their bitch and that's what i want them to do i don't want the if they want to join the military uh at this stage i i would prefer them not to uh because of what i know and my own experience uh but if that's something they wanted to decide to do then i would 100 percent support it and i would be there on their graduation day and i would be there whenever they needed me um yeah. but i would hope that and I don't want to, to generalize here, um, but based upon my experience as a breathwork practitioner and the work that I do with um, trauma with veterans and first responders, I would say a greater percentage of uh, veterans or at least military personnel um, 
have either been influenced to join in some way or another, and it's been less of an autonomous decision on their part. And so uh, I would assert that in my, uh, in my journey as a pirate living father, the way that I encourage my children um, will give them more of an opportunity to make different decisions rather than it's just military and I'm going to beeline for that, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that really um, uh, like resonates with me. I come from a long line of first responders and uh, joined the police department when I was in my 20s. And I thought that was um, that was what I was supposed to do. And uh, I know you you went through the Strong Coach program, correct? Right. Yeah. Um, and one of the exercises that really um kind of hit home with me was one of the first ones where we looked at the link between service and sacrifice. Um, mm. did you do that same that same exercise? The collapse distinction. Yeah, the collapse distinctions. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, between service and sacrifice. And I was wondering how unpacking that was for you. Difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Difficult. Um you know what? Uh, I've I've never I've never looked at it until you've mentioned it right there. I've never looked at that example when I went through the strong coach and practiced that. Um, I was influenced to look at the the role that my wife plays as a mother and my previous wife, what she plays as a mother as well. Um, I always find it expire, uh, inspiring to see um, the innate and natural and intuitive way that mothers behave uh, for their children and show up for their children and so um, I utilize that as an example but to, to think about it now um, I remember going through it and it was a struggle because uh, there was like this deep part of me of like if I'm not this person I'm going to let my father down or if I'm not this person I'm going to let my siblings down because I joined the military at such a young age deployed all over the world with different things and, and different Uh, not in battle ever, but like for different operations. And so I was subconsciously recognizing that I was putting myself through hell by being in this environment. But to me, it was like, it's necessary in order to gain that recognition and in order to gain that acceptance um, from these specific people. And In the recent years or the deep work that I've done in unpacking trauma in my own body, the trauma that's manifested and taken on a physical form of dis-ease in its release or when I have given it an opportunity to release from my physiology, they are the stories that come through. I remember the moments of, you know, yeah, the service and sacrifice of what I was putting myself through in order for what, like what Mm -hmm. was the the result, you know, and um, they are the biggest releases. I recently put my foot in a fire um, and I had third degree burns to all of my toes. Mm. And um, the reason that occurred, I was, um, I was participating in a uh, psilocybin and breathwork journey that I was part of with very, very close friends. Uh, and I'd laid back down on the ground to have this humongous release, which was a hundred percent related to exactly what you've just said, Karen. And um mm-hmm. When that happened, my foot went in the fire. And before it was too late and the pain receptor had gotten back to the brain to let me know something was up, yeah, I'd, I'd burnt my foot. And so um, it's funny that you mentioned that because the last eight to nine weeks I've been healing this <laughs> mini walk. <laughs> yeah. So the work that you're – tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing now. Yeah, cool. Um, so – I have been uh, practicing and applying conscious breath work for the last five years uh, in various modalities. I'm not a um, protocol driven person. I believe they all have a unique and relevant space uh, in the healing uh, environment uh, and container. And so I apply different uh, modalities of breath work uh, to create an opportunity for people to get into a non-ordinary state to release trauma from the body. Uh, I utilize different techniques from psychology uh, to story work and, uh, and then applied conscious breathing. Applied conscious breath work would be uh, the application of uh, an intentional exercise, which involves breathing uh, to elicit a response physiologically in order to gain an outcome or in order to move closer to an outcome. Uh, my primary focus at this stage is uh, 
working with men first and foremost, Brady and myself run a uh, online uh, course called Inflow. And uh, the two of us are working with men across the world uh, to go through these old patterns, break down the old patterns of belief and um, old patterns that aren't serving them uh, and give them the tools to be able to overcome that uh, resistance and those obstacles to break free of that and get into the life of their dreams. Uh, my individual mission is uh, helping veterans and first responders uh, in creating a bridge over the gap that I don't believe uh, exists very well. Lance and Sean are doing a fantastic job as well with the Rising Warrior here in Australia, uh, myself and a very good friend of mine, Dane, who runs an uh, organization called Survive to Thrive Nation. Uh, we're creating this bridge for veterans and first responders to transition without all the bullshit that comes previously. We're trying to mitigate the risk uh, and reduce the stats of uh, mental health um, uh, ailments or irregularities so that uh, these veterans and first responders are better set up for life as they leave or as they transition, even if it's not an elective decision um, and, and they're forced to leave the organization, the military or, or first responder, it get, it's giving them the tools um, and the support that they need to get into the life that they would much prefer to be in. Um, mm -hmm. So the work I'm doing uh, is utilizing exactly that, uh, breath work, psychology, story work, and working with these people one-on-one -on -one to get them to that space. So what would you uh, consider your social rebellion to be then? The way that I apply breath work. <laughs> <laughs> um, in my experience, in my studies, um, there's a lot of rigidity around um, scientific application to breath work, spiritual application of breath, uh, breath work. There seems to be this gang versus gang. Science is better than spiritual. Spiritual is better than science. This method is better than this method. And, and for me, uh, firstly, I, I like to say, shut up. You know, it's <laughs> relevant. You know, you don't get to a spiritual place without the science involved and you can't get to the science place without the spiritual involved. And then with, when it comes to method, I mean, they're all great methods. They all serve a great purpose, but they're not all relevant to one specific person. Um, and so for me, the way I apply breathwork uh, is very unorthodox. I use a lot of science-based evidence um, to get people to a space that I've personally been to. Uh, so when I push the curve or the limit with um, getting people to these non-ordinary states, uh, it can be quite confronting from the onlooker or somebody watching somebody go through one of my sessions. Um, but because I've been to that space and I have all the details and data collected before we go to that space, um, it becomes a more effective tool rather than, uh, you know, and I've used this a few times on podcasts, but rather than going into three rounds of Wim Hof, you know, that, which is an effective tool, uh, this takes it a little deeper. And when it's applied in the way that I do it, um, it is very controversial because people feel very intimidated by what's occurring. It can look like an exorcism. Sometimes people going through some of the practices, it can look like an exorcism and rightfully so our bodies are amazing machines and they're amazing archiving machines as well. And when you let those archives loose, there's sometimes 10, 20, 30 plus years of archiving that needs to come out. Like it's going to look like an exorcism. And so um, that causes the most uh, controversy, controversy um, currently, as well as um, the, how abrupt I am with creating this transition for veterans. Um, it's not that I'm sticking my middle finger up to the military at all and saying you're doing a shit job, but they're not doing a great job in helping <laughs> veterans transition. And so um, the way that my language that I utilize um, can rub people up the wrong way. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um first off, I I can attest to the body when it's expelling like 30 plus years of stuff can look like an exorcism because I when I had like a 45 minute my body just tremoring and at the end of it I'm like the buzzing under my skin of anxiety is gone <laughs> like, <laughs> I thought that just existed um so that yeah I I get that um I have a question because you've mentioned um like on your and on the talk that we had, and then I've seen it on social media too, you've mentioned like people's perception of breath work and what they think it is, is um, perhaps different than how you would explain it. So how, what, what do you consider breath work when you're talking about it? Um, to contextualize that uh, mm -hmm. for what we were talking about, um, 
you know, there's this, there's this movement or at least an energy that is very present of applying breath work to get to this state of being high. Right. And, and it's a really good feeling. I'm not going to disagree with that. Um, regularly, maybe three to four times a week, I hyperventilate myself to a space where I feel high as hell and it's a great feeling, but also knowing when you get to that space, what you can do and the power that's in that space uh, is completely different. But uh, when I'd say, uh, what is breath work? Um, it is, it is when a human stops and gives himself an opportunity to apply some different breathing patterns or rhythms or time domains in order to elicit a response. The response I would predominantly advise people to go to is a downregulated response. Uh, mm-hmm. Response. We live in a very upregulated society. We have, excuse me, collectively just gone through one of the largest traumas I imagine our human race has ever experienced, um, and it's continuing to grow and build. And so. As humans, uh, the social engineering aspect of brainwashing us is telling us that this is the new normal. And for the most part, humans that aren't well equipped or have the education to call the bullshit are like, oh, okay, well, this is the new normal. Okay, cool. Well, I'll, I'll readapt my life and, you know, I'll, I'll go about my way of doing this new thing. No, don't. Like that's, you know, it's, we live in this space of where there is so much information and it's causing our body so much stress. We're becoming so conditioned to the stress that the high level of stress we previously experienced is so diluted that the new threshold for stress is like, what, what's next? What do I have to experience or witness next that pushes my body to that next state of stress and anxiety. And so when we see this compound and compound and compound all the way from you know, look, if I wake up in the morning, I don't even get out of bed and I'm rolling through my phone, that's stress instantly. But for some people that, oh, that's pretty normal, isn't it? It's, it's stress. You've, well, not, we can talk about the blue light emittance and all of that, but when we go into the social engineering aspect of what's, what that's causing the body to go into. Um, and when you live in a state of upregulation and a state of survival, uh, I, I talk about it in inflow as being uh, outside the cave in a primitive sense, it's not sustainable, nor is it sexy, nor is it safe, you know? And so if I'm going to uh, advise anyone to do any breath work uh, without a practitioner or without a coach there, it's in a space of downregulate, use this thing, the most incredible gift you've ever been given your nose to breathe, use the belly to push it, to, to work it as a muscle and sit and breathe in that space. No, it ain't sexy. Sometimes it's not even fun. Sometimes it's very uncomfortable because coming out of stress is very uncomfortable because the body likes it. So, yeah, if, if I'm going to talk about breath work, it's something down regulatory. It's probably through the nose. Not probably. I'll remove that. It's through the nose <laughs> and it's into the belly and it's, it's, it's quiet time, you know. So um, when you're going through... Um, some of these changes and some of the work that you're doing with the breath work um, or even have, helping uh, veterans kind of reintegrate um, into like normal society, have that transition. What are some of the more uncomfortable questions that um, either you've asked yourself or you get your clients to ask yourself, ask themselves for that transition? Hmm. what are you willing to sacrifice in order to achieve the thing that you want to achieve? That's a good one to start with because it's like a little thread tag that you can just pull and pull and pull and pull. And, and it's, it's like the gateway to a bit of story work and breaking that down. Um, The magic for me is in Uh, the psychology of asking the question. So if I asked a veteran, hey, what what are you willing to let go of in order to become this new person? And I can see or read their energy or read their body language or um, notice the words that they're throwing at me in order to justify their story or protect the story or um, the magic's in pulling on that thread and probing that a little more um, and getting to that space. Um, That's a really good question. And when people ask, people ask me, Hey, uh, what's, what's the, what's the most uncomfortable thing you've ever experienced that's caused the biggest 
um, the biggest injury or, or ailment? That's a pretty uncomfortable question to go through and be put on the stand for um, because it's not one thing. And that elicits, you know, taking ourselves back um, to the moment of, uh, let's say, say there's a scenario that occurred and we perceived it in such a way that it caused trauma. So trauma being the outcome of the way that we perceived a situation and you revisit that through thought or something triggers it because of some detail that takes you to a space where your physiology starts to behave in the same way. Again, you know, you get the same amount of cortisol and adrenaline, norepinephrine, you get the same amount, even in, in moments to which, you know, weren't as abrasive, you get this dump of hormones and it can put you in a very unsettling space. Um, mm -hmm. And so I find the magic is right there and being present with whoever it is, or even if I'm being asked the question and, and making sure that I'm engaging and creating a safe container for them to be open about what it is so that they can explore that. If, if I can gain permission and gain trust, then the thing I want most is for my clients to get to, the, get to the space that they want to get to. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to use this word pretty savagely, but sometimes it's important to go beyond. Sometimes it's important to push the discomfort because that's where the, that's where the gold is in the discomfort. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good question though. I like that. <laughs> I'm going to remember that now. Every time I get asked an awkward question, I'm going to remember you asking that. <laughs> <laughs> this is uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, uh, you know, it, that brings to mind, uh, you know, a story uh, of my own. When, um, when I was in the police and I was in the police, I'm, I'm from Bermuda. So I was, that's where I was a police officer. And uh, I was on shift during a hurricane and we had three of our colleagues um, were uh, basically hit by a rogue wave on a causeway and, um, and were missing. I think two of them were found. Um, and I remember it only a couple of years ago. So it's like 15 years later, um, mm -hmm. I tried whitewater rafting and the trauma response that I had whitewater rafting where I was in like complete and utter panic. And I was with a bunch of like my mom's friends. So we're talking about women in their sixties and seventies. And mm -hmm. here I was, being, I, I was there to like, make sure everyone was safe, having a complete and utter breakdown uh, in this whitewater rafting boat. And uh, it was probably a couple of days later I mean, you were in the strong coach, um, We've have we've had Ben Joy uh, on uh, on episode here, um, but I, he was my uh, personal coach at the time, and mm -hmm. it wasn't until we like we sat down and we talked about and really like you said dove into that uncomfortable feeling that I even put the two together. Mm -hmm. um, the similarities of what was happening, we went over some like rougher rapids, and a couple of the people went. Over and we just had to like tootle around and, and kind of rescue them out of the water and like the what that brought up for me was so powerful like I said 15 years later mm -hmm. um and it wasn't until we sat down we worked through that story we worked through those feelings we like did you know a lot of noticing and a lot of naming and really getting accurate with what happened versus uh, in the whitewater rafting versus like the story that I had in my head of what it was, what was happening 15 years earlier. Um, and that was super uncomfortable. And, um, and we talked, even talked about on the episode with Ben Joy, I spent most of my time talking with him in tears to begin with. Um, so that really, that, as soon as you said that, that really brought that up for me. I'm like, yeah, 15 years later, you never know what's just going to trigger you if you've got this trauma that you have not dealt with or yeah you haven't dealt with properly and we had peer counseling and all of that stuff uh yeah. in the moment 15 years ago but um but not to the level where like you said you really facing that discomfort and those feelings and allowing that those feelings to actually come through you and to feel what was going on rather than you know it's the police so you can feel a little bit but not too much because now we've got you know We've got a job to do because we're tough <laughs> very different yeah. approach and a very different outcome 
planning to go white water rafting again, but <laughs> maybe, maybe, but, um, but yeah, your story brought that up for me because yeah, like, yeah, I've been through there. I've been, I've been there, done that. And it, it sucks. And it was, it was really important work that we did together. And did you get an opportunity to um, give your body permission to experience everything that it needs to experience? Um, I, from the way my body responded when I was actually whitewater rafting, I think that's when I experienced what it to experience. So I think that was kind of my honor, what, whatever was happening, like the release. And I know Chris and I have talked about the, the shaking release, the, like all of those things, like my body went through, like I said, the, my mom and her friends were laughing and having a good time. I was not, I was just in this state where, um, yeah, uncontrollable shaking, um, and just like the panic and tears and everything was coming out there. And then in the boat surrounded by, you know, 70 year old women who were enjoying themselves. But, um, so I think that was when really, when my body actually had that release from what happened 15 years ago. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that as well. Um, and I, yeah, I really appreciate you bringing some detail to that. Uh, that's that state is called the mobilization. Uh, you may have may or may not have heard of this um, predominantly in the animal kingdom you see this uh, more notably but uh, in humans it's uh, something that can really go undetected and then neglected there on after especially when it comes to integration um, to which I imagine working with Ben you would have had one of the best integration wizards ever. <laughs> um, hmm. he's an incredible man uh, so the the immobilization is that state of going beyond fight flight or freeze and, and and not doing anything so it's when our nervous system parasympathetic and sympathetic gets overridden and the body just goes into a state of shock and that's mm -hmm. a mobilization um dogs do it every single day they do the shake you ever seen a dog shake from head to tail yeah. uh, uh, that is them trying to disperse uh the inflow of adrenaline and cortisol in the body and they know to shake it or tremor it out of their body um, there's a beautiful video on YouTube that I've used in seminars before where uh, you see this impala being chased down across the savannah by a big cat. Uh, the big cat gets it, pins it to the ground, and instantly the impala goes into a mobilization and it looks like it's dead. Uh, and the reason it does this is a self-preservation thing because it doesn't know whether it's going to die or not. It just knows what's happening right now. And so it can recall the last time that a big cat pinned it and something occurred uh, and distracted it. And so it goes into this state and then in the movie on, on this YouTube movie, um, some jackals or hyenas come along and the big cat runs off. Uh, and then you watch the impala get up and it takes about two minutes for it to get to its feet. You can, you can see it come back into its body. It shakes and then it stumbles off and integrates back into whatever it was going about. Uh, mm -hmm. And humans do exactly the same thing. Uh, there's an incredible man, Victor E. Frankel. He wrote the book, Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, and it's about his experience in the camps, in the war camps in um, Germany. Uh, and he talks about, mind you, he, he went on to become one of the most prestigious uh, psychologists in, in Western society. Uh, but he pioneered this framework called logotherapy, uh, logotherapy. And the way that it works is to take yourself back to the moment uh, where the, the thing occurred, whatever the thing is, uh, and go back through it in detail. Notice, imagine, feels a really good game to go into uh, mm -hmm. because it, it lightens the load a bit more. It gets you to start thinking uh, in a more creative way uh, and it can change it from you know conflict to, ar uh, to architect in that setting itself. Uh, but in logotherapy or logotherapy, um, you'd go back through the experience itself, which is something that I apply when I do breathwork. And I get people to go to that moment and, and then start to name all the detail and then start to go through all the possible risks or dangers that they were experiencing at that time and to give themselves permission or their physiology permission to experience whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Most of the time it's shaking, it's tremoring, it's convulsing. Uh, you can have these capebal spasms or tetany where people get the T-Rex hands and that like this. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the body attempting to hold on to the thing mm -hmm. that was keeping it in there. And so when you release it, the buzzing stops under the skin. The, <laughs> the tinnitus stops in the ears. Um, vision clears up. Uh, I've, I've been able to heal rheumatoid arthritis that was all through my body by going to these places and getting uncomfortable. Um, but knowing, and th this is why I say when we, when we apply breath work, you know, 
we live in an upregulated state because we've not acknowledged all the shit that's happened previous until we're aware of it, right? There are mm-hmm. so many stories that if we kept pulling on threads, there'd be so much there to unpack. And I don't imagine ever any of us are ever going to get to the point where we're completely void of stories. Um, but in that, it's it's giving ourselves a moment to, yeah, downregulate because there's a lot of things that are happening in our bodies and our bodies are incredible archiving systems. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we might not ever get rid of those stories, but, and you get the tools, like as you're developing the tools, like that breath work that you're sharing with everybody, the the more tools you have to integrate, the quicker you can flip those stories and move forward without storing it in your body. So, Yeah, mm-hmm. I, agree. I agree. So what, what does good trouble mean to you? And We'll go with the next part Karan asked earlier. How are you creating good trouble? <laughs> uh, good trouble for me currently is um, providing, providing an opportunity for everyone to be at peace, no matter what, right? I stepped into a container uh, called the Strong Coach uh, where I was honored to receive the facilitation of some incredible humans. Uh, and in that space, I created um, Inflow, my, my, one of my businesses that I now am partnered with Brady Brewer. Um, and we created a certification. It was a breathwork certification. Now, here in Australia, there is a, an Australian Breathwork Alliance where you have to register as a breathwork practitioner in order to officially work as a breathwork practitioner or have any businesses. As part of that registration, you need to tick 95% of their criteria of how you're going to facilitate. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, because the human experience isn't based off a set of criteria. It's not, it doesn't, you can't, you know, you can't measure it. You know, some of the greatest um, f- like uh, physics experts in the world would always say that the one variable you can never control is consciousness. And it's such an accurate statement. And so um, the work that I'm doing, I'm very persistent in the way that I'm doing it, no matter what. I've had so many people saying, hey, you can't do that or you can't practice that way because um, you've not done the, the five-year apprenticeship or you can't practice this way. And so for me, good trouble is, is applying the skills that you have to offer of service to the human race, uh, being of service um, and a higher service and a higher good. Uh, and I'm currently doing that um, with uh, the work that I'm doing with Inflow, uh, with Breathcast. Um, and one thing that we haven't spoken about is my documentary that I'm filming next year where I'm running across Australia. So I'm running from one of the most Western points to the most Eastern points uh, and filming a documentary. I'm doing a marathon a day. And the way that I'm doing it is to essentially call out the bullshit of this, um, this reintegration package that the military organization believes that they are giving to veterans and first responders as well. And so in calling out that bullshit, we're going to be documenting on film um, the way that it's not happening and, and show not just the statistics of, um, you know, uh, suicides from veterans and first responders post-service, uh, homelessness, um, the mental health uh, statistics that people are currently uh, a part of. We're not just going to be showing that I'm going to be getting veterans on the documentary with me telling their story as well. Um, and then we're going to be filming and um, showing the work that we're doing so that more people go, okay, there is something life's not over yet. I've still got another chance. I can still do this. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe that's good trouble because it's of a higher service. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what I'm currently doing right now. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Um, tell us a little bit about Inflow and Breathcast. Because you mentioned Inflow, and that's what you're doing with Brady. Yep. Correct? 
cool. Yep. Our friend Brady Brewer, check mm-hmm. out his episode. <laughs> he, he also left us a, a collaborative playlist that we like yes. to mention. So yes. link <laughs> in <Yeah>. bio. Yes. <laughs> Go add some songs. <laughs> <laughs> he's an incredible man i love um every time he's running a session i'm always saving songs that he's put in or something like that <laughs> um yeah so brady and i um are co-creators of inflow inflow is a 12-week immersion uh where we go through um the archetypes of our human experience we go through um breath work anatomy physiology we go through story work and then we utilize music to guide all of it um my uh unique application of breath work has always been with music uh which is what drew brady and i together and his application with story work has been through music and breaking down the elements of music and vibration and sound to get to a space of uh, resonance in ourself and alignment in ourself in the 12 weeks um we've experienced everything from um deep healing of stories to um currently having uh men leave their nine to five corporate gig that they've been doing and take up the the coaching life that they've been dreaming of not only that resigning turning around, coming back in the same door and asking the same boss if they can coach their corporate environment to lead them to a more effective capability. So there's some of the things we've been seeing uh, in Inflow there. Uh, it is a very um, in-depth uh, course where because we, we are teaching a lot of um, breathwork protocols. We're talking uh, ways of how to manage and handle energy. We're looking at um, advanced anatomy physiology and the way that the body behaves not just in a, um, a 3D plane, in a physical material sense. We're talking in metaphysical sense as well. So we go into detail in that. Um, currently guiding uh, coaches, leaders, entrepreneurs, CEOs, um, people who are seeing the value in being able to offer what we're teaching them to their own communities or their own work environments or um, teams. Breathcast is the breathwork version of, of calm or headspace. Uh, in actual fact, my 10-year vision. So this partnership is with Matt Shiver and Nick Mayer. And mm-hmm. um, our 10-year vision is to finally uh, go over and buy calm off the owners and amalgamate the two and call it Breathcast. Mm-hmm. Um, mostly because I'm very attracted to Matthew McConaughey and his voice, um, <laughs> <laughs> primarily because I want the one holistic space and for people to be able to go to this one space. But Breathcast is the, the, version, the breath version of that. And it's, it's a way for people to bring breathwork into their own lives without upregulating themselves, without having to go to YouTube and type in Wim Hof Method and create more um, friction in their lives uh, when it's not needed. And that's not to say Wim Hof's not a good method. It's a fantastic method. Uh, But uh, for some people who are already in a state of survival, that's not a real good method to go into, uh, to integrate into that. So we release five episodes a week uh, and the episodes go from five to 15 minutes, always guided uh, by myself. I have some other coaches coming on uh, very soon as well. Uh, There's music and it's a very, very simple practice, mostly nose breathing uh, and mostly circular or box or triangle breathing. And it's an opportunity to bridge the gap for people to go, oh, okay, this is what breathwork is. And this is how I can bring it into my life. And this is how it can bring value to my life. So there are those two things there. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. Is that mm-hmm. an app? It is an app, yep. Oh, nice. I saw the website. Pull the return like, phone. Yeah, <laughs> like, I'm like, that's an app. I saw it on Sorry. the website. So I was mm-hmm. I was intrigued, but I hadn't like gone super deep into it yet. But now I want to, I want it. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. We can, um, so uh, we currently have two affiliate codes for um, Sammy Satakario's reparenting podcast Mm -hmm. and then Ryan Sprague's Highly Optimized. So get you ladies uh, an affiliation code Mm -hmm. as well and set you up um, in there. And so the listeners have a good opportunity to be able to explore breathwork in a different Mm -hmm. environment as well. Absolutely. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Um, So then where where can our listeners go to find out more about you and um in flow breathcast to follow you as you do your docu- documentary this coming year all those things um instagram and youtube is where i'm predominantly uh present if i am um i have the one instagram at william njb 
And uh, through that, I have um, the inflow information, always got Breathcast stuff in there. Breathcast has its own um, Instagram page, so it's more of a business card. Uh, it's not as active. And the documentary is uh, Project Light Doco, D-O-C-O, uh, to where we will be, we'll be doing, uh, someone will be operating that while I'm doing the documentary, but there'll be like where I'm at, how far I've been, what veterans coming on, what first responders coming on. Um, we have some special guests coming from the States to come join me. That were significant uh, inspirations in my journey. A um, couple of them are coaches in the strong coach. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, you'd be able to follow up with that. Uh, and then on my personal one, we have class three starting in January, 2022 for inflow uh, and the applications are open now, the early bird tickets uh, and Brady and I are currently going through all the applications and, and interviewing people as well. So that's all there to, to see on my Instagram. Excellent. <laughs> um, how would you uh, recommend our listeners go about starting their own pirate life? What advice mm. do you give them? Mm. I personally lent into a, a lot of discomfort when I started my pirate journey. I, it was the polarity of what I was living. If I, if I looked at what I was doing, it was the complete opposite to what I'm doing right now. And I lent into that because my heart felt called to that. I noticed when I put myself more in that environment. So a uh, good example is joining the strong coach. When I invested in the strong coach over 12 months ago and I started meeting all these beautiful humans, I knew that I was on the right path and I knew that what I was doing um, was close to what I should be doing. And, and I imagine that it's always going to be close. I imagine it's always going to be an iteration of what I should be doing. And so if I give anyone any advice on, on starting a pirate life or a journey, it's to lean into what puts a smile on your dial, what fills your cup, what makes your heart feel so full no matter what, no matter you're breaking rules, upsetting people, what makes your heart feel full, uh, feel so full, lean into that. And that's where the magic is. Excellent advice. <laughs> yeah, I'd say it's top advice of um, the last like seven or so interviews we've done too. Yeah, so. <laughs> that's, oh, yeah very good. Yes. Like 48 um, out of 50 pirates recommend. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Those other two, we don't count. <laughs> yeah. They had other good advice. <laughs> Drink rum. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that brings us to our last question. Um, and I'm going to ask, do you remember the joke before I tell you the joke you wrote? <laughs> I do. Yeah, I do. Um, you do? Yeah, I was speaking halfway through. I was like, oh, that's what it was. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you want me to ask the joke? Yeah, if you remember it, I'm going to let you ask it. <laughs> I hope I don't look here. Um, what lies at the bottom of the ocean floor and twitches? What? A nervous wreck. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good one. Even though we knew the answer, it was <laughs> we appreciate um, you bringing it. That's a great joke. You are very welcome. <laughs> well, I just want to thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a great conversation. Um, I always love when we talk about, you know, uh, military and first responders as, as something that hits home for me. And I know for Kristen with uh, the work that Lance and Sean mm -hmm. are doing. Um, so, yeah, we really appreciate the work and uh, for you coming on and chatting with us today. Thank you. You're most welcome. It's rock and roll, guys. There are no rules. This one goes to 11. <laughs>